Well, I'll give you a warm welcome to our worship service this first Sunday of September. I'm going to get underway in a moment or two as we read uh, from Psalm 24. And later, of course, after we've had a time of praise, uh, we'll hear the word being read from Joshua again, and Rod will bring the message from it. But let's just uh, turn our attention now to the time of praise that we're going to have. And just to set the, the tone, let's read from Psalm 24. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Amen. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Basically those who have had their sins cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus. And we're going to uh, sing our first song, uh, which is, I will worship. And it's just that declaration saying that we will worship the Lord. You alone are worthy of my praise.
song, O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name. The earth is filled with your glory. Nice to have Amy helping us with the piano this week. Thank you, Amy. Let's uh, turn then as we magnify the name of the Lord enthroned in Zion.
we long for your return and Lord we thank you that you've promised uh, to go and prepare a place for your people and if you have gone and prepared a place you've said that you will come back and take us to be there with you and so Lord we thank you for that promise but Lord you've also promised that you'll be with us even until the end of the age because we have to live our lives here uh, on earth until that day or until we go to be with you Lord and so Father we just ask you for your help uh, in life help um, that you've promised grace and strength that you've promised if we if we're humble before you and, and seek your face then uh, your the righteousness of christ will be added as we seek you first and so lord we just thank you for this time that we've been able to honor you with our lips and lord we just uh, thank you for your word as we'll turn to it in a moment we just Commit the reading of it to you, Lord, and pray that as we hear it read and then as we hear it expounded on, as Rod comes later to, to share from it, we just pray that you would uh, feed us, Lord, and that we would uh, have that nourishment from your word. And we just commit that to you as well, Lord, that as, as we hear it, Lord, that we would also uh, wish to obey it, want to obey you um, as your servant challenges us from it later. So we just commit that to you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This week's reading is from Joshua chapter 18, starting at verse 11, through to the end of chapter 19. The lot of the tribe of the people of Benjamin, according to its clans, came up, and the territory allotted to it fell between the people of Judah and the people of Joseph. On the north side, their boundary began at the Jordan, then the boundary goes up to the shoulder north of Jericho, then up through the hill country westward, and it ends at the wilderness of Beth Avon. From there, the boundary passes along southward in the direction of Luz to the shoulder of Luz, that is Bethel. Then the boundary goes down to Ataroth Adar on the mountain that lies south of Lower Beth Horon. Then the boundary goes in another direction turning on the western side southward from the mountain that lies to the south, opposite Beth Horon, and it ends at Kiriath Baal, that is Kiriath Jarim, a city belonging to the people of Judah. This forms the western side, and the southern side begins at the outskirts of Kiriath Jarim, and the boundary goes from there to Ephron, Ephron, to the Spring of the waters of Nephtoa. Then the boundary goes down to the border of the mountain that overlooks the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is at the north end of the valley of Rephium. And it then goes down the valley of Hinnom, south of the shoulder of the Jebusites, and downward to En Rogel. Then it bends in a northerly direction, going on to En Shemesh, and from there goes to Geliloth which is opposite the ascent of Adummim. Then it goes down to the stone of Bohan, the son of Reuben. And passing on to the north of the shoulder of Beth Araba, it goes down to the Araba. Then the boundary passes on to the north of the shoulder of Beth Hogla, and the boundary ends at the northern bay of the Salt Sea, at the south end of the Jordan. This is the southern border. The Jordan forms its boundary on the eastern side. This is the inheritance of the people of Benjamin, according to their clans, boundary by boundary all around. Now, the cities of the tribe of the people of Benjamin, according to their clans, were Jericho, Beth Hogla, Emek Kezes, Beth Araba, Zemariam, Bethel, Avim, Para, Ophra, Chephar, Amoni, Ophni, Giba, twelve cities with their villages, Gibeon, Rama, Biroth, Mizpe, Chepira, Moza, Rechem, Urpil, Tarala, Zila, Haileth, Jebus, that is Jerusalem, 
Gibeah and Kiriath Jearim, fourteen cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the people of Benjamin according to its clans. Then on to chapter 19. The second lot came out for Simeon, for the tribe of the people of Simeon, according to their clans, and their inheritance was in the midst of the inheritance of the people of Judah. And they had for their inheritance Beersheba, Sheba, Molada, Hazar Shual, Bala, Ezem, El Tolad, Bethel, Horma, Ziklag, Beth Markaboth, Hazar Susa, Beth Lebeoth, and Sharuhen, thirteen cities with their villages, Ain, Rimon, Ether, and Ashan, four cities with their villages, together with all the villages around these cities as far as Belath Beer, Rama of the Negeb. This was the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Simeon, according to their clans. The inheritance of the people of Simeon formed part of the territory of the people of Judah, because the portion of the people of Judah was too large for them. The people of Simeon obtained an inheritance in the midst of their inheritance. The third lot came up for the people of Zebulun, according to their clans. And the territory of their inheritance reached as far as Sarid. Then their boundary goes up westward and on to Marial and touches Dabesheth. Then the brook that is east of Jokneam. From Sarid it goes in the other direction eastward toward the sunrise to the boundary of Chisloth Tabor. From there it goes to Daberath, then up to Japhia. From there, it passes along on the east toward the sunrise to Gath Hefer, to Eth Kazin, and going on to Rimon, it bends toward Nea. Then on the north, the boundary turns about to Hanathon, and it ends at the valley of Ithtaphel, and Katath, Nahalal, Shimron, Idala, and Bethlehem. Twelve cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the people of Zebulun, according to their clans. These cities with their villages. The fourth lot came out for Issachar, for the people of Issachar, according to their clans. Their territory included Jezreel, Chezaloth, Shunem, Hapharaim, Shion, Ahaharath, Rabbath, Kishion, Ebez, Remeth, En Ganim, En Hada, Beth Pazes. The boundary also touches Tabor, Shahazuma, and Beth Shemesh, and its boundary ends at the Jordan. Sixteen cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Issachar, according to their clans, the cities with their villages. The fifth lot came out for the tribe of the people of Asher, according to their clans. Their territory included Helkath, Hali, Beten, Achshaf, Alamelech, Amad, and Mishal. On the west it touches Carmel and Shihor Ibnath, Libnath. Then it turns eastward. It goes to Beth Dagon and touches Zebulun and the valley of Ithtahil, northward to Beth Emek and Nile. Then it continues in the north to Kabul, Ebron, Rehob, Hamon, Cana, as far as the Sidon, the Great. Then the boundary turns to Ramah, reaching to the fortified city of Tyre. Then the boundary turns to Hosa, and it ends at the sea. Mahalab, Achzib, Uma, Afek, and Rehob, 22 cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Asher, according to their clans. These cities with their villages. The sixth lot came out for the people of Naphtali, 
for the people of Naphtali according to their clans. And their boundary ran from Heleph, from the oak in Zaanaim, and Adami Nekeb, and Jabneel as far as Lakum, and it ended at the Jordan. Then the boundary turns westward to Asnoth Tabor, and goes from there to Hukok, touching Zebulun at the south, and Asher on the west, and Judah on the east at the Jordan. The fortified cities are Zidim, Zer, Hamath, Rakath, Chinereth, Adama, Rama, Hazor, Kidesh, Edri, Enhazor, Yiron, Migdal El, Horem, Beth Anath, and Beth Shemesh, nineteen cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Naphtali, according to their clans, the cities with their villages. The seventh lot came out for the tribe of the people of Dan, according to their clans, and the territory of its inheritance included Zorah, Eshtaol Er Shemesh, Sha'alabin Aijalon, Ithla Elon, Timna Ekron, Elteke, Gibbethon Belath, Jehud, Beni Barak, Gath Rimon, and Me Jarkon and Rakon, with the territory over against Joppa. When the territory of the people of Dan was lost to them, the people of Dan went up and fought against Leshem, and after capturing it and striking it with the sword, they took possession of it and settled in it, calling Leshem Dan, after the name of Dan, their ancestor. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Dan, according to their clans, these cities with their villages. When they had finished distributing the several territories of the land as inheritances, the people of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua the son of Nun. By command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he asked, Timnath Sirah, in the hill country of Ephraim. And he rebuilt the city and settled in it. These are the inheritances that Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel distributed by Lot at Shiloh before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So they finished dividing the land. Amen. Well, good morning this Lord's Day, and uh, as we come to uh, the Word of God, uh, let our hearts be opened to the prompting of the Holy Spirit as we hear what God has to say for, to us uh, this morning. Uh, it was good for uh, Mark, again, to be reading uh, these lists of the allotments of the lands. Uh, to the seven tribes of Israel. And uh, the question that we have uh, this morning is, have we that radical faith that enables us to be overcomers? We're going to look at four things this morning. That radical faith requires the remnant to act that radical faith requires resilience. Radical faith requires a release. And radical faith requires revelation. So we've looked at uh, these two chapters, chapter 18 and chapters, chapter 19. And we're looking at the allotment of the land to the tribes. It's been hard reading all the names and the places uh, over these past weeks. But as we previously mentioned, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach. 
what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do right. So these verses have something to teach us. Joshua asks them such a searching question in chapter 18 verse 3. How long will you put off going to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? And as we look at these seven tribes, Benjamin, Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali and Dan, we ponder, will they ever overcome their laxity? and press on to clear out the local inhabitants. Joshua has done what he can in allotting the land by the will of the Lord. He's pointed the tribes to God and said it is God's will that you have been allotted this land, so therefore go and possess it. He's prodded them to action, to get up and to get on. He's challenged them, how long will you put off God? How long will you continue to show yourself slack about doing what God has asked you to do? Will you not just possess the land? As we read chapter 19, we need not take too much notice of the geography of the detail, but we should note the general location of these tribes by lot. It was God's will. He had placed them where he wanted them. And he plants us where he wants us the very best place that he wants us to be, that we will receive a blessing. And then in Joshua 19, at the closing verses, in verses 49 and 50, he says, when they had finished distributing the several territories of the land as inheritances, the people of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. By command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he asked, Timnath Serah, in the hill country of Ephraim. And he rebuilt the city and settled in it. On God's authority, Joshua was given what he asked for, the town of Timnath Serah, in the hill country of Ephraim. As we reflect on these verses covering the territorial descriptions, we begin to see a framework that God is laying out. It begins with the granting of the inheritance to Caleb, and it ends with the granting of the inheritance to Joshua. These then are the two bookends of the allotment of the land. And we can see that there is a contrast between the positive views of Caleb and Joshua and the negative views of the other seven tribes. Caleb asked Joshua for the mountain and the land of the giants, for he had faith to conquer them. And Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he says that in Joshua 24. Both men were faithful in obedience to God and their dependence upon God. This contrast must drive us back to Numbers 13 and 14, where the 12 spies entered the land. But only Caleb and Joshua were willing to stand by uh, faith in the promises of God to overcome Canaan. Two 
out of the 12 spies were willing to stand on the promises of God. Amazing things can be done when we sell out to God and trust Him for everything. To be humble and dependent upon God. And our first point is radical faith requires the remnant to act. God promised that the remnant of these two would in fact enter the land in Numbers 14, verses 24, 30 and 38. In Numbers uh, 14, 24 it says, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went and his descendants shall possess it. And then verse 30, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Joshua, and uh, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive. The rest would die in unbelief. What a salutary message for us this morning. We cannot lose our salvation, but we can be rendered useless for God if we allow unbelief to dwell in our hearts. When we remain unmoved and hardened towards God, we're in danger of grieving the Holy Spirit. When God revealed his plans to enter the land and they rejected it, they were rejecting God. This then is an act of willful resisting of the Holy Spirit. Jesus in Matthew 12 said, rebuke them that resisting the Holy Spirit uh, and he gave them a grave warning. You see, the Holy Spirit is the means through which God acts on within our hearts and our minds that changes into the kind of people he wants us to be. Resisting the Spirit involves a refusal of that power that allows us to change. The book of Hebrews addresses how the attitude of rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit can manifest itself among believers through spiritual neglect and persistent sin. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. The faithful and true believer will acknowledge confess and repent of his or her sins and ask for forgiveness. When we do this, we take comfort in knowing that these sins will not lead to the second death because we are active in a relationship with Christ and that will enable us to be overcomers. Radical faith requires the remnant to act, to act now and be obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Don't resist, don't rebel, it could cost you dearly. Radical faith requires resilience. Both Caleb and Joshua were faithful men of God. 
Caleb at the age of 85 was a man of faith who asked for what God had promised. And God had promised it 45 years earlier. And Joshua, uh, his name is Deliverer, a type of Christ, was leading God's people into that promise. He believed that God was all-powerful, that God was faithful in his promises and would be ever with him. He would be courageous and not dismayed, for he knew God. Both men had experienced God firsthand and they had trusted him. It was always God and Joshua and God and Caleb and not Joshua and God and, J and Caleb and God or just Joshua and Caleb. God placed these faithful servants as bookends to the tribes who were allotted their inheritance. What we see here is these men of faith were resilient because they saw a future beyond the present. Their hope in God gave them a capacity of the heart to draw from the present and connect with a purpose that opened up a bigger sense of who they were and what they were capable of doing. What do you see is your future beyond the present? Do you know your God-given destiny? That is where your resilience comes from. That enables you to be an overcomer of the problems and difficulties in your lives. They knew how to cope despite the setbacks and barriers or limited resources, because they were dependent on God. They knew they were weak and easily discouraged, but when they turned to God, they found strength to overcome. Have we that radical faith that enables us to be overcomers? Can we experience living in fear and walking in faith. Well, this sounds like an oxymoron, but when we think about it, fear and faith make poor bedfellows. Where one is found, the other can't exist. Fear and faith both demand you believe in something you can't see. You choose. Both Caleb and Joshua knew this as a reality. That's why God told Joshua to fear not. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua and Caleb turned everything over to God. That was radical faith that enabled them to take all God had allotted them. Have you that faith that overcomes the problems and barriers in your life? They didn't have an easy time. It was hard work. It was dangerous. It was taxing. But they believed God. Now that's Resilience. God wants us to be more than conquerors. But you can't exercise faith without a relationship with God. Miracles begin with relationship. Caleb and Joshua had an experiential relationship with God that was tested, that was tried, and that grew grew in trust. Whenever they were faced with a disaster, they would release it to God. So radical faith requires release. 
When we say to God, here it is God, I've done all I can do in the situation and now I release it into your hands. As long as we hold on to the problem, as long as we own the problem, God will not touch it. It is radical faith when I do all I can do and then release it to God. We need to give over to God those things that are bigger than us. It's then that we see God doing the miraculous. The problem, however, lies with us. We take back the things that we have released to God. Whether it is taking back control of something, or trying to figure out our own way, or worrying about the situation that's out of our control. All these things cause us to take back what we've released. Every time we release something to God and then take it back, we're taking on more than we can handle. And we do this without even realising it. When we release it to God, we need to leave it with God. The first step of radical faith is trusting Him. We must know His promises to us. And knowing His promises will help us to have tremendous peace. Knowing that He promised to take care of us. We were never meant to handle everything on our own. And that's why we feel weighed down by the cares of this world when we take on those responsibilities that we should never have taken on. If you feel and find yourself worrying about something again, stop right there and release it to God because God will take care of it. He promises that if we do this, his peace, that peace that passes all understanding, will flood our minds as we put our trust in him. I hope you're hearing this message this morning and find that peace in whatever circumstances, circumstances you find yourself in. And lastly we come to that radical faith that requires revelation. God wants to give you what is yours. The promise, your inheritance, your destiny. If you don't take heed, if you allow, like the Israelites, the wicked inhabitants to dwell in your land, then you will fail. When God reveals his word to you, he demands a response. Impression without expression leads to depression. When God reveals his word to us, we need to take action, otherwise we will depress the Holy Spirit. The seven tribes partially believed, but partial belief leads to partial obedience, and partial obedience leads to disobedience, and disobedience leads to sin, and sin leads to death. You can't expect God to do something for you when you don't trust him, when you don't worship him when you don't serve him, when you don't seek him. And then at a time of trouble, you ask him to do something for you. Well, how rich is that? Radical faith requires us to take action when all around you are saying no. Radical faith needs resilience to bounce back when we're knocked and battered and bruised. Radical faith needs release to God 
those things that we can't do. And radical faith needs to know God's word at the point when we want to quit. Radical faith turns away from the wickedness and is obedient to the word, the word of God by faith. Have we that radical faith that enables us to be overcomers? Well, let us pray together. Our oh Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word this morning. May you speak to us through your word, that we would have that radical faith that would transform our lives, to know that you are intrinsically involved in our very being, to direct us, to counsel us, to guide us into all truth. Lord, help us to have that experience of you in our lives by faith. And that we would walk forward, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the difficulties and the hurts and barriers that are before us. Seeking to release to you all the things that are burdening us. And then trusting you that you will give us the path to walk and that you will carry us through. Lord, as we hear this message this morning, we would ask by, that by your Holy Spirit, you would speak into the hearts of all those who are listening. And that this would be a word of comfort, that it would be a word of encouragement to each one of us as we seek after you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Lord, we stand upon that promise to know that when we trust in you and humble ourselves before the throne of grace, that you will provide for our every need. And so, Lord, give us that radical faith to be overcomers in whatever situation we find ourselves. In and through the precious name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. And now as we conclude our time together, we'll ask Mark and Tina to uh, finish with uh, our last hymn as we can raise our voices, as we can raise our hopes, as we can raise our hearts to be in tune with the living God. Thank you, Rod. Yes, we will now close the, the service, our time of praise this morning as we sing the song, You Have Been Given the Name Above All Names, with the other verses there, We Are Your People Made for Your Glory. And then you have redeemed us. Uh, and it's just, I um, just want to give all the glory to the Lord. Yes, we worship you.
Father in heaven, we bless you and praise you that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of your Son. And we just pray, Lord, that you'd help us in this coming week to live for you, to serve you, to worship you in all that we do. And so we just ask that you go before us now, asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen.